It's actually kind of a foreign concept to the Bible. It's kind of more of a modern concept. And I know someone's thinking, well, what about the Psalms? Well, what about the Psalms? It was a brief period in Israel's history. The rest of the time they worshiped God, they didn't do that. The early church did not do that. So um, worship simply means to serve. And devote. so we're talking about love and devotion. So you can sing a song out of love and devotion, and it is worship, but we've reduced all of worship down to just that, right? Thank you. I'm going to preach over here this morning. <laughs> But one of the great things about meditation is when you have a foundation for getting into your heart and shifting your consciousness or shifting your awareness. Consciousness is just a fancy word for awareness, what you're aware of. So um, when you practice getting into your heart, shifting your awareness from your head to your heart, from your thinking to more of your central part of your being, and then using your imagination to connect. And I realize when we're going to do an, an imagination-based meditation this morning, and I realize that when I do that, some of you um, have an imagination that is more developed than others, and I always feel sorry for people who can't make pictures, who think, who believe they can't make pictures in their mind. It's actually psychologically and neurologically impossible for you not to be able to make pictures. Uh, the reality is, is that we, we block our awareness. We block our awareness from being able to do that. But uh, you always do that. And you may, you may say, well, I never remember my dreams, but you remember some dream. And you couldn't have dream, dreamt without that image-making faculty working at an unconscious level, meaning without you trying to make it work. Got it? So I want to talk briefly before we start to those of you that have trouble making picture, making faculties, you can still follow it with your mind and your awareness. And if you'll relax, if you'll quit trying so hard, and you'll just relax into the process, and you will follow it mentally, just like you would a story. Somebody can tell you a story, and you can follow it mentally, and yet maybe you don't picture it in your mind. Got it? So for those of you that can picture in your mind, I want you to Imagine it as vividly as possible. Those of you that have more difficulty being aware of the fact that you already are making pictures in your mind. You should notice how I language that. I didn't say you can't. I said you're having difficulty realizing that you're already doing it, and that's okay. Um, just follow it with your stream of thought. Does that make sense? So with that in mind, close your eyes and put your hand, if you would, over your heart. We're going to take just a, a few breaths to get into our hearts. So I want you to be aware of your heart, and I want you to take a, a deep breath on a count of five, and here's what we're going to do. We're going to do it together, so keep breathing, obviously, while I'm talking. <laughs> but, but with your eyes closed, and as you're relaxing, in a minute, when I tell you we're going to take a deep breath to a count of five, we're going to hold it for two, and then we're going to exhale, count of five, we're going to do that three times. Got it? So ready, let's take an inhale. One, two, three, four, five. Hold for two. Exhale, two, three, four, five. Good. Inhale, one, two, three, four, five. Hold for two. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five. Last time, deep breath. Inhale, one, two, three, four, five. Hold for two. Exhale, one, two, three, four, five. Now, keeping your eyes closed, I want you to just let your breathing return back to normal. Still being aware of your heart, but you can place your hands if you want to on your lap or beside you. Just get comfortable. And just take a few more breaths, and as you inhale, relax. And as you exhale, just let go of any stress or tension or thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I want you to become very aware right now of your heart. And um, just being very aware of it, feeling it, noticing it. <clears throat> 
And I want you to imagine a shaft of light coming up from your heart that is sort of like opening a doorway or a passageway for you to drop your awareness from your thinking faculties in your mind down into the deeper places in your heart. So as you're imagining that shaft of light, then I want you to imagine yourself descending through that light into your heart so that you're settled, your perceptions are settled inside of your heart. So that if you were to look up, you would actually see your head and your brain. And so just being at that place in your heart where you're settled in your awareness, I want you to do that. I want you to look up and sort of see your head. And I want you to see a small sphere of light, white light, in the center of your head. And just focus on that. And as you're focusing on that, it's like the crown of your head just opens up. And you can imagine the crown of your head opening up, and then it's as though you shoot from your heart through the top of your head and out of your body into the clouds. And you keep rising up until you're in outer space. And you can look around in outer space and you can see the stars, the sun, the planets. And I want you to look down at your feet and I want you to see the planet Earth. And so as you're looking around, you can see the stars and the planets, constellations around you and earth at your feet. And then I want you to see <clears throat> Christ standing above you. And as you look up at Christ, you can see his heart. And there are flashes of light that are pouring out of his heart that becomes almost like a stream or waves of light that are pouring from his heart. And as they pour from his heart, you become the recipient and the receptacle of that light so that you begin to receive that light that's pouring from the heart of Christ into yourself until you are nothing but radiating with the light and energy that's coming from Christ. I want you to notice how that feels. And then as you're there in space, receiving the light of Christ, I want you to begin to imagine it pouring from your heart into your hands so that you're holding your hands out like a cup and receiving that light. And then you begin to pour it down. It's almost like your, your hands just serve as a receptacle that receives that light and then pours it down upon the earth. So that the light is pouring from Christ, filling you, then pouring from your heart into your hands. And from your hands, it's pouring into the earth. And I want you to imagine that light going into the earth and covering it. Covering all of the dark places. Covering <clears throat> all the places where there is strife and hurt and pain in creation. And that light is transforming. 
and that light is healing. And that light is total, unconditional acceptance and love. And you can continue to imagine all the different places in creation. All the different situations in the earth that light is affecting and transforming and healing. Once again, I want you to become aware of yourself in space, radiating with the light of Christ. And I want you to look up <clears throat> into Christ, into his eyes. And I want you to let some communication flow from your heart, just by thought, from your heart to his heart. And then communication flowing back from his heart to your heart. And then I want you to just give thanks and appreciation and begin to descend back. <coughs> begin to descend back. Back into the earth. Back into this room. The light radiating out of the top of your head, flowing back through the top of your head until you're fully seated and situated back in your physical body. In this room, becoming aware of your feet on the floor, your back on the back of the chair, becoming aware of the position of your body, becoming aware of any of the sounds in the room that you might be hearing and noticing right now. Becoming aware again of your breath. And I want you to take three gentle breaths. And on the third breath, I want you to open your eyes gently and bring yourself back into full awareness of the fact that you're right here. Rub your hands together. Rub your feet on the floor, kind of tap them, just to get yourself grounded back here, right? <clears throat> and let's pray. Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the light and the life and the wonder and the glory of who you are. Thank you that you've created us in your image to be reflectors of your glory. Thank you for releasing us to make a difference in our daily lives. 
uh, in the world around us by simply changing our vibration. Lord, I thank you that as we do that, it helps and heals humanity and creation, which is waiting for the manifestation of the children of God. And so we give you thanks. We give you praise for that. I give you thanks for every person that's here. I ask that you will bless the rest of our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand up. Stretch a little bit. Just getting you back in the room. How was that? Was that a... All right. Go ahead and be seated again. <laughs> I'm going to have you stand up again here in a second. Um, so it looks like I just want to talk about the building real quick. I know it's really shifting gears from where you were, but uh, I'm doing that on purpose because I want to bring you back in the room a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> So it looks like, for sure, we're going to close on the 27th. I mean, something can always happen between now and then, but that's getting close, right? So I don't know what, about 10 days away from that, nine days away from that. So uh, end of an era and whatever with that, but uh, we won't be able to fully pay off our building, but we'll be able to pay um, eh, more than half of it off. Uh, and then have some cash to decide what we want to do going forward. So we'll keep you informed with that. Um, but thank you again to everybody who's helped and participated. And uh, it was just kind of interesting being around in that building and thinking about all the times and stuff. And um, I know Jackie and Jeanette were talking, and they're like, we raised our families here. <laughs> so uh, it's just been a good time. But I'm excited about where we're at, excited about the opportunity to go forward. And uh, so we're going to receive our offering. We're going to pray over it. Um, but I want to thank you. Uh, every gift, every dollar is meaningful and helpful to us. And uh, I'm excited, really, about where we're at. I mean, we, we have an opportunity to make a... We've made a transition in the way we're doing services and approaching and presenting things. And so now I think we're, we'll get through this time of the sale and come early fall, I think we'll really be ready to make a surge and make an impact. So it's exciting. Um, so we'll put the baskets out. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to put the baskets out this morning. We'll pray over the offering. We'll put the baskets out. You can bring your offering to the front. And also, while you're doing that, get around and greet each other. Maybe somebody you haven't greeted or don't know, look around the room. Maybe just go over and introduce yourself real quick, and then we'll get into the message. But before we do that, let's pray for the offering. So Lord, thank you for opening the windows of heaven, pouring out a, a blessing that there is not room enough to contain it. Thank you for increasing and blessing and expanding us in our individual lives, in our families, and as a church family. We give you thanks. We give you praise. Lord, we thank you that we're able to do this together. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you want to bring your offering and just get around and greet some folks, we'll give you a couple minutes to do that. Thank you. There is healing in the house of God. I said, there is healing in the house of God. Amen. When I came into this room, my heart was heavy. I struggled just to make it through the day. Suddenly I felt his holy presence And the pain inside began to sleep away Right away I knew that something happened Sometimes this microphone pack just shuts itself off. I hope I don't have to get a new one. <clears throat> that would not be fun. Okay, so we're going to look at um, the Bible this morning in this. Um, and we haven't been doing that as much in this first service, but we're going to do it this morning. I'm going to share some uh, 
secrets with you. Jewish secrets. May not be that secret, but you'll see it all over the Bible, but unless you're looking for it, it most people don't. So understand that from a New Testament perspective, the most important thing to understand from the Old Testament, one of the most important things to understand, is this idea that Judah and Benjamin and Israel as a result, because remember the tribe split. There were 12, uh, Jacob had 12 sons, which then became 12 tribes. And you had one united kingdom of Israel for a brief period of time. And then they split into a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The southern kingdom was made up of the 10 tribes because when they go into the promised land and take the land, the land is divided by the tribes, right? So when the, when the kingdom splits, you have 10 tribes in the south and you have two tribes, Judah and Benjamin in the north. Now, because David was the king that had united uh, Israel, and he was the man after God's own heart that God chose, right? He came from the tribe of Judah. So he is from the northern tribe. So the northern tribe was where uh, the government of Israel was centralized. So to be a Jew or to practice Judaism is to be specifically from the northern tribes. It's a very important distinction because they had different forms of worship and whatever. So without going into the whole history of it, there's a split. The Assyrians come in and wipe out the southern kingdom, take it over, wipe it out. And the Babylonians come in and take uh, the northern kingdom captive and into Babylon for 70 years. So that's what happened to Israel, right? So, the issue is, God had promised that there would not cease to be a king in Israel that would sit on the throne, but when the, they came in for Babylonian captivity, that ended. And they're in exile. And they're not only in exile from the land, they're in exile from the presence of God. Because the presence of God dwelt inside, what, the temple and when the Babylonians came in, they destroyed the temple. Now, you have to understand there was this whole temple system of worship and religion. The law was not central in the sense that we think about it to Israel when you're reading the Bible until you get to the exile. It was central in the sense that there were temple laws. So go back and read Leviticus. And if you look at Leviticus, there's all this, you know, killing, slaughtering animals and all this stuff, right? And sacrifices and different things that they had to do. It just, it, it troubles me <laughs> that Christians want to try to go back under the law, if you will, um, because they're calling it Jewish roots or whatever, because... I mean, even a good Orthodox Jewish person will recognize of the 613 commandments in the Torah, they can only keep about 200 or some of them because the other like 400 laws are temple laws and there's no temple. So people say, well, we got to keep the Jewish feasts. And so they go back and they try to keep the Jewish feasts. The only problem is you were commanded to keep the Jewish feasts in Jerusalem at the temple. <laughs> So my point is, is that you have a, a, a group of people who are in real crisis. Now, w within these temple rituals, there was a, I'm going to use this term, somebody's going to get triggered, but I don't care. <laughs> no, I really do. I really do care. I really do want to be understood. There is what, what they would call a temple cult. Now, a cult is not necessarily a bad term. I'm using it as, in, its, in its purest form as just a group of people who were committed to being initiated into doctrines and mysteries. And that temple cult was called the priests. Got it? All this to set up Ezekiel 1. Because the first thing you find out about Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 1 is he is a priest. 
Second thing you need to understand is he's in exile. He's by the river Cape Chebar, which is a double reference. It's a river in Babylon, but it also means uh, the river of deep remembrance. And that's important. So he's by the river Chebar, so he's a priest and he's cut off from the temple, which means he never has the opportunity to experience the presence of God. So what happens is, is he says uh, in verse 1, Now it came to pass in the 13th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, I was among the captives by the river Chebar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. That should not happen outside the temple. This is very important. So then he goes into this massive vision where he sees living creatures and he sees wheels within wheels and he sees thunders and lightnings and fires and clouds and all this crazy stuff, right? And you sit there and you read that and you think, what is this? And for years I would sit there and read that and think, what is this? And what it actually is, is it's what, what the, um, it's God, and now remember you're dealing with an ancient people, so they have ancient conceptions of God. So they're, what, what they see coming, or what Ezekiel sees coming, is the chariot throne of God. And what he has is a full throne room encounter. Right? But it's a mobile throne. That's why it has wheels. And it's being carried by the cherubim. And the wheels, the ophanim, which is a separate being in and of itself. And the spirit's in the wheels, and it's got eyes, and it's just a crazy thing. I mean, it's a crazy thing to sit there and try to, try to meditate on and imagine, right? Now, the reason I'm pointing this out, and this is important, is because the central text for Second Temple Judaism, the central text for them, for the reorganization of their religion, the one out of which Jesus came, the one out of which the apostles came, the one out of which the New Testament came, is Ezekiel chapter 1. Now, I will tell you how failure to understand that has messed us up, even in our translations. Because in Mark's gospel, when Jesus is baptized in the Jordan, he's baptized in a river, and it says this specifically, the heavens opened, and I saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, right? And I heard a voice. Yes? The mind of the, the person who understands the centrality of this, this Ezekiel text understands that when Jesus is baptized in the Jordan, he's not just getting the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. <laughs> he's having an, an Ezekiel 1 encounter. Now, here's how it gets messed up. In our Bibles, it reads, he went into the wilderness and was with the wild beasts. And the angels ministered to him, right? And so here's the idea that we get. He goes out in the wilderness with like, like this would be heaven for my son Josiah. He's out there with the lizards and the, and the, and the crocodiles and the turtles. Well, probably not crocodiles, but the turtles and the tarantulas and the scorpion, right? He's out there with the wild beasts, the snakes, right? But actually, what it, it, the way it should be translated is living creatures, because in Ezekiel chapter 1, what comes out of the cloud are living creatures who are heavenly beings. And the angels ministered to him, the angels uh, attended to him. Everybody tracking with me? So this is central. Now, but here's the other thing about this. So what the, 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 the many of the devout Jews of the day were seeking, because here's the point, what Ezekiel did was it opened up a way for them to reform their religion without a temple, to say that you don't have to be in a temple to encounter the presence of God or to enter into the heavens. And it became an experience that would be opened up to anybody who would choose to seek it. And the Hebrew term for it is Merkava. Merkava, and that simply means the chariot. And so you have all these Jewish people who are seeking to have Merkava experiences. Now, 
Something else in your Bible that may not have made sense, that will make sense now, is you remember the stoning of Stephen in Acts chapter 7? I know I'm going deeper in the Bible this morning, I'm sorry. But you remember, in, uh, Stephen gets, so if, if you don't know the story, Stephen's a follower of Christ, and he's talking to the Jews, and he's giving them their whole history of how they were, you know, started and went into the uh, Egypt and brought, came out of Egypt and went into the promised land, went into captivity. He's, he's, he's preaching this whole message to them. And they, they get so angry at him because he's telling them how they consistently reject God over and over and over again, culminating in the rejection of his son, Jesus. And they get angry at him and they start to stone him. He's the first Christian martyr, right? They, they start to stone him. But then something very interesting happens. It says that he looked up, it says, and he looked up and he saw Christ standing at the right hand of God. He has this open vision of Christ standing at the right hand of God. And he begins to describe it, and the most interesting thing happens, it says that the guy, that they plugged their ears and attacked him and started to gnash at him with their teeth. Why would they do that when he said, the heavens are open and I see the Son of Man? He didn't say, I see Jesus. He said, I see the Son of Man. Here's why. Because this encounter was considered, the methodology for attaining this was so sacred that it was secret and it could not be talked about in public. In fact, you were forbidden to talk about the Merkava in front of more than two people. So when Stephen begins to talk, he begins to talk about the mysteries of the Merkava. So therefore, they plug their ears because he's breaking that code. And they become so angry, they begin to gnash at him with their teeth. So part of the reason Paul is being persecuted in the New Testament is not because he's just saying that Jesus is the Messiah. He is being persecuted in the New Testament because he's talking openly about heavenly mysteries with the Gentiles. And we completely miss it. So I'm saying all this to say this is secret stuff. Got it? But it's important to understand for you. I'm going to make it practical for you in a minute. But because we have a certain paradigm that is completely wrong and false and misinformed when we talk about these things. And, you, and that's why it's secret. Because you start sharing it openly and religious fanatics go crazy. It wasn't just kept secret to keep it away from you. It was kept secret to keep them safe. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of the Spanish Inquisition was about this stuff right here that we're talking about right now. All right. So let's pick it up. (laughs) Verse 25. So here's this majestic vision. Here's this throne. Here's this firmament or heaven. And it says, above the firmament of the heaven and over their heads, the cherubim's heads, watch this, was the likeness of a throne. He didn't say a throne. He said the likeness of a throne. In appearance like a sapphire stone. Look at how many times he's using the word likeness. On the likeness of the throne was a likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. He didn't say God. He didn't say the Lord. He said a man. Everybody say a man. Also from the appearance of his waist and upward, I saw as it were. So from the waist up, the color of amber with the appearance of fire all around and within it. And from the appearance of his waist downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire with brightness all around it. Like the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness around it. This was the appearance of the, everybody say it with me, likeness of the glory of the Lord. Listen to the language. He does not say this is the glory of the Lord. He is very specific to say it is not. He's saying it's in the likeness and the appearance of the glory of the Lord. It's important because the word he's using over and over and over again is first used in the Torah when God made man in his image and after his likeness. Here's why it's important. Look what he says. Hold on just a second. (laughs) 
Oh, sorry. So he goes on. All right. So the, the appearance of a rainbow in a cloud in a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of one speaking. And he said to me, son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. Then the spirit entered me when he spoke to me. And then he set me on my feet, and I heard him who spoke, and he says, son of man. So here's the issue. When, when he peers into the glory, and he sees into these higher realms, he sees into these heavens, he sees the likeness of a throne, and he sees one like the son of man sitting on the throne. In the likeness of the glory. Then he hears a voice, and what's the first thing he hears? He hears a voice, but what does the voice call him? Son of man. Now, the word for man there is Adam. So he sees one. <laughs> so he's using the term for Adam. Man, I'm feeling the presence of God. He's using the term for Adam. Who's, or, I'm sorry. He's using the term for likeness. And Adam was made what? In the likeness of God. And then he says, son of Adam. Let me just check myself. Then this, stand on your feet. Stand up. Rise up. Ascend. Right? And I will speak to you. <laughs> then the Spirit entered me when he spoke to me and set me on my feet. There, this isn't just about him standing up. Yes, sir. There's a mystery here of ascension. And really, spirit baptism. So you want to know the conclusion that the rabbis came to, the secrets they weren't supposed to talk about. You know who Ezekiel saw on the throne? Himself. <laughs> he saw himself radiating with fire. He saw himself glorified. All right, so let me make some statements. Maybe this will help you. All right, your core self, your core self, this is where hopefully we get practical, <laughs> is divine energy or divine light. It is eternal your body's going to perish, but it's interpenetrated by your spirit. So you have to think about yourself as being a multidimensional, energetic, spiritual being stuck in a human experience. So here's Ezekiel. This is a bad time. This is a bad time for Ezekiel. He, he's, by, he's, he's cut off from his occupation, his purpose. He's a priest, but he, without a temple. There are people without a homeland. They're captives. They have a religion, but their temple's destroyed. They believe the glory of God has left them and exiled them. And so he's sitting there, and all of a sudden he has this experience where, he, my point is, while he's doing that, he's trapped in the human experience. He's stuck in it. He doesn't know he's multidimensional. So the whole point of the experience is to connect him to what they call in some circles his higher, his higher self. All right. All right, so let's say it this way. Your true essence, listen to the statement, your true essence is divine and is made of light and love and power.
And although your spiritual self or your true essence is never disconnected from us or never disconnected from us, our spiritual self is never disconnected from us, it exists in a higher vibrating spiritual dimension. The issue is consciousness and awareness. Okay, now when you begin to look, you understand this is the mystery that they've been hiding. So Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, it's been given to me a stewardship to make known the mystery which God has been hiding for generations among the Gentiles, which is, what is it, saints? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Because what did Ezekiel see? So it's being hidden and told in stories. So Jesus, so John, John is brilliant at this. So in John chapter 9, there's a man who's born blind. A man who's born blind. And the disciples ask him, who sinned, this man or his father, that he was born blind? Right? Now I have a question for you because we don't realize that Jews believed in reincarnation. Because here's my question. How could they even pose the question, who sinned this man and his parents that he was born blind if they didn't believe in past life? I'm really getting myself in deep trouble. <laughs> this is what studying will do for you. So, so here's the dilemma that the Jews are having. When, when you read in your Bible, the sins of the father are passed down to the fourth and fifth generation. The way that reads in the Hebrew, there was a debate. Is that children or is that future lives? Because it just means recycled. They're debating it in the time of Jesus. So they're inviting Jesus into this debate. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? They're asking him to comment on that verse and settle it for him. What does Jesus say? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, watch this, but for the glory, but that the glory of God might be manifested, that the glory of God might be manifested or revealed. Now watch this, he's born how? Blind. So what does Jesus do? He spits in his eyes and makes some mud. He makes clay, which takes you back to God forming Adam from the dust of the clay. Watch what he's doing. And he pops these things in his eyes. So probably he's born, I mean, realistically, he's probably born with just eye sockets and no eyeballs. So he makes eyeballs, pops them in there, and then what's he tell him to do? Go wash in the pool. Go wash in the water. See, all this stuff's happening around water. Ezekiel's by the river Chebar. Jesus is baptized in the Jordan. Then he tells him to do what? To go wash, right? So when he goes and he washes, what happens? He sees. But what does a pool do? with light. It reflects it. So who does he see? He sees himself. So this man who's born blind, the first thing he sees after Jesus touches him is not Christ, he see, not Jesus, he sees himself. In fact, Jesus is, yeah, thank you. Jesus is hidden from him. Jesus is hidden from him. Watch this. Because later they're like, they're like, who healed you? <laughs> I don't know who healed me. All I know was I was blind, but now I see. But who did he see first? <laughs> now watch the spiritual parallel. Forget that it's a story and, and understand they're, they're, they're teaching you. So, and then Jesus begins to talk about spiritual blindness. So he's talking about all of us. He's talking about all of us. And the issue is not who sinned. Who sinned? This man or Adam that he was born blind? <laughs> is it the result of your own personal sins? Or is it the result of the sin of Adam that you're in the condition that you're in? And Jesus is like, it doesn't even matter why you're in the condition that you're in. But it's a condition of perception. It's a, it's a condition of perception. So this man's cut off from his own image. 
So when Jesus does the miracle, he takes you back to Adam (laughs) and his eyes. Because remember, when Adam ate at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what happened? His eyes were open, right? But he began to perceive. So what happened was, you, you have always had this higher self. You have always had this core spiritual self that is a light self, that is filled with light, that is filled with power, that is filled with glory. And you're never separated from that self. You're always connected to it. But your consciousness is unaware because you've been born blind. And it doesn't matter if it's because of your sins or the sins of your parents or the sins of, fa- of your father Adam. The issue is you are cut off from seeing your own image. And what What Jesus comes to do is he comes to give you eyes that can see and ears that can hear so he can connect you with the Christ who is not just Jesus the person but but is the heavenly man of whom we are all cells to connect you with your divine self That's what the baptism in the Spirit does. So God says, okay, now that you see yourself, now you've got to stand up on your feet. Now you've got to rise up. So he sets his intention, but he can't do it himself. He doesn't do it himself. The Spirit enters him. (laughs) See, the Spirit cannot enter you until you're aligned with your divine self, which is not seated in Christ in heavenly dimensions and heavenly places. So why Christ says, if your, your life is hidden with Christ in God. See, the whole thing starts to make sense. When Adam eats at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what does he do? He hides himself. You don't even get it because we read it in such a carnal way because it has to be a historical story because, you know. The Bible, it's, they, I can't go there. It's a parable. It has deeper spiritual mysteries that you're supposed to be seeing that connect with you. When Adam hides himself, what self is he hiding? (laughs) His divine, he's, he's hidden his divine self. That's the self that God walks with in the garden in the cool of the day that he couldn't find. (laughs) That's the self he could no longer see. And without being clothed in that self, now he's naked. (laughs) Now he's naked. Now he's vulnerable. Now he's without. You see it? So he makes fig leaf. (laughs) Why didn't he just take a banana leaf? A lot bigger from what I understand. Save him a lot of time and energy. (laughs) He hides himself. See it? So here's a man born blind, can't see himself, can't see his image, can't see his likeness. You see it? I'll show you one, one more thing. and then so, so this is what it means. When Jesus said, I, I used this term last week, and it just it, it messed people up. <clears throat> when I was talking in the second service about being born again, because in the mind, I mean, it's deeply embedded in our minds that being born again means the moment you got your fire insurance got out of hell and got into heaven and got saved. I'm a born again Christian, which is your way of saying you're a fun damn mentalist. Sorry. I'm sorry. I'm being naughty. But do you see what I'm saying? But Jesus didn't even say, yes, he's talking about being born again, but, but he didn't even say be born again. He said be born from above. Well, what birth, what has to come in? So what, what has to happen is that higher self has to connect with the self that's down here so that it can be pushed through the birth canal of your own consciousness and faith into manifestation so that you become a child born of the Spirit. 
Now you're free. Now you can go where you want to go. Do what you want to do. The wind blows where it wishes. But nobody can predict it. Because you're walking from that higher realm and that higher dimension. All right, so in Ezekiel 30... 8, 37. <coughs> Remember the, some of you be familiar with these stories, some of you not. God takes uh, that, <laughs> verse 1, the hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit <coughs> of the Lord, <coughs> excuse me, and sent me down in the midst of a valley and it was full of bones. So he sees this valley of dry bones and, and God tells him prophesy, right? Prophesy to the bones. And he speaks to the bones and the bones start to come together. And he says, prophesy to the, to, the, to the breath and to the winds. It, again, when God created Adam, what did he do? He breathed into him the breath of life. All these things are connected. All of it's talking about you and bringing you back to help you understand who you are. This is true. Now watch this. It says um, in verse 11, then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say, Our bones are very dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. It's a terrible translation. Our hope is lost, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and here's how you should read in the Hebrew. And we are cut off from ourselves. We are cut off from ourselves. So see, that's the problem. See, now it all makes sense. You, you were dead. See, this is all New Covenant stuff. Ephesians 2 now. <laughs> Even when you were dead and your trespasses and sins were in, you used to walk. God, who was rich in mercy, <laughs> made you alive together with Christ and raised you up. The Spirit entered me and raised me up. Raised me up and seated me in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might manifest the riches of his glory in us. So see, you have this higher self that's seated in heavenly places in Christ that you are never disconnected from, but you're often blinded to. And so the encounter, people, you know... This is why this just makes religious people go nuts. Because we say, you know, you need to encounter the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Yes, you need an encounter with the Lord. But watch what Jesus did with the man born blind. He wanted to, him, him to encounter himself. And then later he gets a revelation of who Jesus is. See, we have it all backwards. We think that if we get a revelation of who Christ is, then we can get a revelation of who we are. But the problem is, what we come up with then is a very distorted image of Christ. Because we're still seeing Christ out of our fallen consciousness. Therefore, we project our twisted and distorted views of how we think onto him. So before we can see and know who he is, we have to see and know ourselves. So we have to go wash in the pool of Siloam so that we get the mud out of our eyes and see who we are in the image of God. And then once we see who we really are in the image and the glory, it's then and only then that we can begin to perceive him for who he actually is because we're perceiving now through our higher self rather than through the fallen mind of Adam. Which, which was the whole problem in Israel. They were perceiving God through the fallen mind of Adam. So they do things that are vindictive. They do things that are murderous. They do things that are terrible. They, do, they, they create a society that by the time Jesus shows up is totally fragmented. You have to understand that part of the story of Israel is the fragmentation It's the fragmentation. God gives them the very best law. You can't get a better law. You can't get a better government for the time. Can't give them a better king. And what happens? Within a couple generations, it fragments. 
The North splits from the, the South. They're arguing about religion. They're arguing about all this different stuff. And then pretty soon, they're carried off into captivity so that the whole thing is left fragmented to show you that the fallen mind of Adam only alienates you from God, alienates you from people, and ends up in, in, in dispute and war and ugly, monstrous pictures of, dog, of God who orders genocide. And in the book of Psalms, where it says that God rejoiced to see an infant skull dashed upon the stones... And we think, oh, the word must be giving us a revelation of God. No, in the Old Testament is the revelation of the projection of the fallen mind that's been cut off from the higher self. So God begins again in Babylon with Ezekiel by saying, okay, now here's how we're going to do it. (laughs) We're going to begin prophetic revelation by aligning with your divine self so that when you see your divine self out of that lens now, you can begin to see who God really is. So it's out of that place then that God can bring the fullness of the revelation of who he is. So that when Jesus goes to the cross, what you have is the twisted, distorted mind of religion and government not recognizing the face of God, projecting their evil onto it. So that God could part the veil and say, listen, I do not operate as... I do not operate as a totalitarian dictator or as a John. (coughs) Sorry, John. (laughs) Here's what I mean. I do not force you with my power to serve me a la turn or burn. And I do not pay you to love me. Allah, if you obey me, I'll bless you. Because Jesus was fully obedient, and look what happened. (laughs) And yet as God, he had every right to bring judgment, and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Because the heavenly man, I'm going to give you this last little bit and then I'm done. The heavenly man is one man. The higher self, your higher self, is a cell of the, the image of God who is the Adam. Who exists in heavenly dimensions. Which is why only the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. Only one man could go into the Holy of Holies. The order of Melchizedek is one man. The fallen mind fragments. The higher mind, you realize, it begins to unite. You begin to see the glory in yourself and realize no matter how awful someone is, they're doing it from a place of spiritual blindness because they have not seen who they really are and they have not reconnected to the whole or to the one. If you just get this message and listen to it like 10 or 15 times and go back and read your Bible, it'll be a total game changer for you. All right. Lord, thank you for today. Just pray for your spirits to continue to move amongst us as we meet next service. Bless this word, Father. Bless these people. Um, Let there be powerful impartation. Father, open up the heavens right now and pour out the spirit of wisdom and revelation that our eyes may be opened, the eyes of our heart may be opened, that we may begin to connect with our higher divine selves and walk in power and authority and glory and light and love and truth and harmony the way that you designed and created us to do. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said. Amen. <laughs>